guys, welcome to Bones Collector, and on today's video we are going to talk about some games. I went to a couple of flea markets recently and acquired some board games for my library. Uh, some I will be keeping, some I will not, but I wanted to play them and, and tell you about them and show them to you on a video. So uh, without any further talking, here they come, right at you. Okay, so here's the first game that I picked up, and I got this for $30, yeah, 30 bucks, and it's a legendary a James Bond deck building game. I have not played this game, and I've played Marvel Legendary, and I had that for quite a while in my library, but I just don't like Marvel. I mean, I'm, I'm just burnt out on Marvel, and it's one of those things that you just get saturated with, and it just ruins your taste for it. So there's no Marvel in my library whatsoever, and I'm, I don't miss it, so yeah. Anyways, yeah, this is a James Bond deck building game, and I loved Legendary. I just didn't like the theme, so I picked this up from somebody that wanted to get rid of it. And I think the base game comes with 500 cards, and then this has the expansion with uh, three other movies in it. So um, I can't wait to play it. And it comes with this neoprene play mat in the box. I really love that. And, of course, you know, when my grandsons ask me who's my favorite superhero, I always tell them uh, there's two, and that's Sherlock Holmes and James Bond. Those are my two favorite superheroes. Even though I grew up in the 60s and, and was reading Marvel Comics and DC Comics, uh, I was always intrigued by the intellectual superiority of Sherlock Holmes and the adventure and courageousness of James Bond. So those are my two super, superheroes. I cannot wait to play this game. I'm thrilled to have it, and I know I'm going to love it. It introduces some new mechanics, uh, different from the Marvel Legendary, and I can't wait to play James Bond deck building game Legendary. All right, what's next? Well, why not talk about this game <laughs> since we're on the James Bond theme? I know nothing about this game. This game uh, was $15 on Amazon, so that's why I picked it up. Uh, I will have to admit that, and uh, plays one to four, and, or two to four, excuse me, and it's a really chintzy looking game. I mean, this is like mass-produced uh, stuff in here. Uh, there's only like 30 cards uh, that go with the game, some tokens, uh, and some cubes here, a James Bond poker chip, or I mean a 007 poker chip, but it does have these big chunky dice you're going to roll. These are like the size of uh, King of Tokyo. I couldn't think of the name. And then these... Uh, plastic things you're going to put all over the board and seed the board with. And and the thing that intrigued me about this game was that uh, one of the designers, well, a couple of designers, Antoine Boza, uh, was involved in this project, and um, Matt of Lu Ludovic LeBlanc or something. And, of course, Antoine Boza did Seven Wonders, one of my favorite games of all time. But yeah, whenever I see his name on anything, but there's the board, I'll kind of... Wiggle it around a little bit for you. I'm kind of wanting to play it. See what happens. I know nothing about it. Like I say, you're just trying to become the, the best supervillain that you can become. Number one, uh, Inspector, which is the evil organization that James Bond's always fighting against. And yeah, see, oh, there we go. Let's see what you can become. Can you become number one? Yeah, that sounds like fun. I think I'm going to become number one. I hope that game's not number two, though. All right, then we're going to move on to, what else did I pick up? I picked up Codenames Duet. Uh, Lori and I had this before, and we really liked it. We were in a calling mood one day, and we <laughs> sold this. Really by mistake. Yeah, and of course, it's by Velada Chivadal, uh and Scott Eaton, it says. But uh, yeah, this is an outstanding game, and it's for two players, so we really enjoyed it. I don't know if you've ever played this, but you lay out these cards, and you're just going to give word clues, trying to link as many cards together as you possibly can with one word clue, and the other player tries to guess those cards, and you have all these different cards that you're going to, it's going to tell you how you lay out the, the grid of cards and so forth, and you're just going to try and do the best you can at this game. <laughs> but the Code Names is a very pop popular game, and this is the two-player version, Code Names Duet, and I was glad to get it back, to be quite honest with you. Okay, let's talk about, let's talk about this game. Blood Rage by Eric Lang. Art by Adrian Smith. Blood Rage came out in 2015. I played it way back in the day. I was not impressed with it, so I never sought it out. I, I thought it was a big to-do about nothing. You know, years and years have gone by, and lo and behold, I was at a flea market, and this person wanted to sell this game, brand new, for 30 bucks. You know, it's a like new copy, and I thought to myself, well, maybe I'll give it another chance. And so I've played it two more times, and I 
really haven't found anything that <laughs> in there that makes me want to keep this game. And here's the thing that irritates me about one of the one of the things that irritates me about this game. Okay, let's look in the box. This game is 80, 90 bucks. You know what you get for 90 bucks? That. You get some disc, disc tokens here. You get these uh, tiny cards that, that the art on them are, is terrible. Uh, some plastic rings for different player colors. Four different player colors, plastic rings. Some more little cards with bad art. Some other tokens. I mean, some people love it. And that's it. And the rest of this is just plastic. And that board is one of the ugliest boards I've ever seen. So I don't know what the intrigue is with this game. I'm missing something. I, you know, not all games are for all people. But that's all you get in this box for 90 bucks. And that, that just freaks me out. Yeah, I, I'm going to play it two more times. I play every game five times before I dump it. And I'm going to give dump it to crump it. And I'm going to give this another two plays. Because I played it three times now. And I would probably try and sell it and get my 30 bucks back. So, yeah, that's Blood Rage. All right. What else we have? Well, let's talk about another big Simon game. Zombicide, Black Plague, The Invasion of the Zombies. <laughs> I picked this game up in like new condition for $40. You've got a bunch of gray miniatures in this box, but I will have to admit I had fun playing this game. It is thematic in that you're just going to be overrun with zombies. You know, that's the whole thing. This is a, a cooperative game, and it's crisis management for the players. You're just going to be spawning all these zombies and getting rid of them and dealing with them as best you can. And you have different scenarios in this book that you're going to play through. And the only thing I you know, kind of don't like about it is most of the scenarios, when you play it two-player, you've got to play like two or three characters each. And some people aren't going to like that. I don't particularly like it, but it's not too bad in this game. And... Uh, so yeah, here you get, I'll show you what you get. Dude, this is like, if those of you haven't seen Zombicide, you know, you got all these components and things and, oh, and dice and these uh, board tiles that, uh, you know, I suppose these are supposed to look drab and dreary on purpose. I wish they were more colorful. That's just my taste. Uh, you've got, uh, again, these box here full of plastic and you got a bunch of dashboards and character cards in here that you're going to use uh, during the game and you keep track of your stats in these peg holes and so forth and you can put cards in here stand them up so you have different items you can use at different times so i i, I found enough in this game to like about it that i think i think i'm going to keep this game even though this stuff is unpainted which looks like crap but, I, you know, it's, they're unpainted, so it takes away from the fun of the game a little bit. But I think I'm going to keep this, because I got it cheap. If you like cooperative games, and if you like zombies, hey, it's a no-brainer. But that's uh, Zombicide, Black Plague. I've never played any of the other versions of Zombicide, nor do I want to. This was plenty of Zombicide for me, and that is Zombicide. Uh -huh. Okay, what else did I pick up? I picked up this game, Praetor, for $5. I like this game. I had it before. We sold it. And when I saw the price point on it, because it was brand new, I said, yeah, I do want to take that home. And Praetor is a cool game because in it, the dice that you're going to use on your player board, you're going to age them and retire them on your player board. So you're going to age your dice and, and eventually retire them off your board, and that's pretty cool. But I think there's other games that have come out since Praetor that, have, that do that now, but you get these beautiful city tiles that you're going to go through the game and purchase them and put them in, your, in the city tableau, and if you put your color marker on them and another player wants to use them, they have to pay you, so that's pretty cool. I like this game, folks, and if you get the chance to pick this up, I, and you like Euro gaming, I mean, uh, I love me some Euro games, you're going to love Praetor. It's a lot of fun, and it's very creative, again, because I think it there weren't any games out at that time that did that aging mechanic with dice. So that was pretty cool. Put this stuff back in here. Very cool game, Praetor. Oh, it's totally, totally underappreciated. Um, it's amazing how that can happen to board games. All right, and this game I just got in the mail. It's an old game. 
Pueblo by Kramer and Kaisling, two of my favorite board game designers ever. And they ran a Kickstarter, and I did back, back this on crowd, crowdfunding, even though I tell you guys not to, uh, because it's not a good idea. I think it was the name of that. There's a company that just went bankrupt, Ninja, Ninja something. something or another, that uh, took $1.3 million in funding from you and me and whoever backed them, which I didn't. I'm just saying people like you and me, and they lost all their money. Uh, they went bankrupt, and now that's $1.3 million bucks that uh, they lost out of the gaming community. And I'm sad for those people that lost their money, but that's why I tell you, stay off of Kickstarter and GameFound and other crowdfunding sites. I could go on and on uh, about why you should not do that, but I feel bad for those people who lost all their money. All right, this is Pueblo. Let's talk about this game. This is a simple abstract strategy game. And in it, you can see how you're just going to be stacking these blocks on a turntable board that comes in the box here. And then this chieftain goes around. The way it's scored is if you're on the first level, your color blocks are worth one point. If you're on the second level, your color blocks are worth two points. If you're on the third level, three points. And fourth level, four points and so on. But the goal is whoever's got the most points, you lose. Yeah, so you're trying to hide your stuff. And you've got a bunch of neutral blocks you're going to use also, these white ones. And you want to block the chieftain from being able to see those as the game progresses. And this game is so cool. I mean, look, at it came with all these stitched bags for each color of blocks, uh, for each player color. And then the neutrals go in this big black bag. And then this is the turntable, the playable turntable. And that's the board that goes on top of it and just spins around, hooks right in there. And it turned out pretty good. And I saw some negative reviews, even one by Tom Vassell. He didn't like the way his game came. I mean, mine came wonderfully done. I, um, I don't think we had any major problems of any kind with it. So I was kind of scared when I saw his video, but I don't know if, I don't know what he's talking about. I like this copy. I like the turntable that comes with it because even if you have the older game, you have to turn that board that you're playing on in order for players to see what's happening. I saw people on Board Game Geek using a Lazy Susan to play this game. But hey, this game is fabulous. It's outstanding and it's different. And I love that. And that's Pueblo. Okay, there's another game that I picked up, <laughs> Lori did, uh, G the Guild of Merchant Explorers. She, she picked this up for 10 bucks at the flea market, <laughs> and I said, 10 bucks, yeah, like, go ahead and get it. It's, it's, you know, it's Matthew Dunson and Brett J. Gilbert. These guys are great designers, and we played this game last year, and I loved it, but we didn't like uh, the fiddliness of putting down the little cubes that you use in this game. I'll show you what I'm talking about. And I thought they could have maybe done a different publishing job in this game. And here's your player mat. You know, it's that, um, like, vinyl stuff. And then you're going to lay cubes on this map in various ways to score points. And the cubes, like, you got to be careful with your fingers. You don't bump them uh, when you're taking them off for, during scoring. But the game itself is fabulous because you have a deck of cards that you're going to use. And on the, you have this board here, and these are the cards that are in the deck. And you know that, you know those cards are in the deck, but they're gonna come up blindly at random. So you, you're like, okay, we've done that one, we've done that one. I still have the, the double question mark, so I can put cubes, uh, that card's yet to come up. So when I play this one, I wanna place these cubes over here on the board, on this board over here, so that I can get to this city when I get the double question mark, because I can play any color I want to when I get that. So you're gonna do a lot of forward planning in this game. And then on top of that, you have another deck of cards in here that give you one special benefit uh, each round, and you're going to reactivate those as they come up on this part right here. So arrow one, arrow two, arrow three, and then you'll have one that you can take your pick. And so you're planning on those cards too. You know what those cards are. You know, you're going to plan it so that these will mesh with the actions that you're going to take here because you know everything is going to come up, just not when. So you're trying to plan uh, around when those things are going to happen. It's a very cool game. I loved it when I played it the first time. I just didn't really care for the publishing, but for $10, you know what? It's a great game. <laughs> I'll put up with it. That's exactly right. Because <laughs> these guys know how to design a board game, and we really love the Guild of Merchant Explorers. Okay, here's another game that I got very cheap, $15. Uh, 
Uh, it's called Tidal Blades Heroes of the Reef. And it's designed by Tim and Ben Eisner. And I played their game, Wonderland's War. I didn't really care for that. I saw this game this, you know, on the virtual flea market. $15, you know, and I had been up to my uh, neighborhood game store and took the lid off of this game. And there's a ton of stuff in this box. I mean, the publishing is just off the charts in this game, folks. I'm not going to take it all out of here. I mean to tell you there is a ton. Okay, I'll take some of it out. Take us, and these are your player dashboards with these dials that you're going to be tracking stats with. And hopefully, I can get in here without too much trouble. And you can see, I mean, the card stock in here is all linen, and I mean, every deck, even the small decks, all linen card stock. And you have a lot of cards, a lot of player uh, pieces. Then you have all these beautiful dice. Now, I mean, there's a ton of dice in this game. It's a worker placement game, first of all, but you're also going to be acquiring these dice and upgrading them so that they're more powerful as you go on. Now, we've played this game three times, and um, I still don't know how I feel about it, if it's worth me keeping, to be quite honest with you. Uh, it was fun enough. We had to make some house rules in order to make the game fun for two players because a two-player variant offered by the game is just not a good one. Yeah, very fiddly, and you don't want to mess with that when you're trying to play a board game. And and so I, I, Laura and I are still discussing whether we're going to keep this. But we've played it three times. I'll play it two, twice more and decide if it's a game for us. But, you know, usually if you don't know if, <laughs> by the third play, um, a lot of times it doesn't get any better. But we'll give it a go and, and see what we feel about it because it is a big box to hang on to and a lot of good stuff and i'm sure i can get my 15 bucks back which is uh, you know important also but yeah that's tidal blades heroes of the reef all right here's a couple of teeny games one's called mini rogue and one's called long shot the dice game i've looked at long shot the dice game i mean i'm always a sucker for this uh, magnetic closure stuff yeah that's that just gets me right there, <laughs> like Biblios and <laughs> yeah, and uh, Wizards of the Grimoire. <laughs> but yeah, you got this little uh, board here that is your track. And come on, oh there it goes. Okay, this is your track. You've got these little wooden horses that you're going to race around this track. And I mean, there's a little bit to this game. It's pretty interesting uh, because it's it's not uh, something that uh, what was that. Other horse racing game we had? Homestretch. Homestretch. Homestretch was very elementary, but I like Homestretch. If you have Homestretch, yeah, I like that game a lot. And I have mixed feelings about getting rid of that. But uh, yeah, here's what you've got. You get these pens that you're going to be keeping track on these boards with, uh, you know, stats and stuff for your horses, bet, betting and so forth. And then you have these wooden horses that are pretty cool. Yeah, and they're all screen printed, which is kind of nice. And then these eight-sided die and a d6 that you're going to be using in the game so yeah i was intrigued by it and again this was a ten dollar thing that Lori saw at the flea market and was able to pick it up and she said hey what do you think you want to try that for ten bucks hey let's try it what the heck oh shoot i better put the board back in there but uh it looks interesting and i like racing games that aren't cars so yeah that's a long shot Mini Rogue. Mini Rogue is a little dungeon crawler. It's just what it sounds like. You know, you're a little mini rogue, you know. You're digging your way through the dungeon. I haven't even opened these yet. But you you lay these cards out, three by three grid. You have a board where you're going down, and depending on what level you're in is what you're going to do when you turn this card over. So it's really a cool game. You're exploring and going deeper and deeper into the dungeon. And that intrigues me because I... I like this little box. It travels well, and it would be nice to have a little dungeon crawl game with me when I go somewhere on the road and visit people. And I just like the sounds of this little mini rogue game. So my cats are going to get in here and bother me because they want to be all up in my business all the time. All right, all right, that's that. Okay, what else we get? I'm trying to speed this up. This is Tapestry from uh, Stonemeyer Games, and this is a game designed by Jamie Stegmeyer. I had this game when it first came out, sold it on one of my calling moods, and I picked this copy up for 35 bucks. And yeah, it's one of the, you can see here, one of the uh, first printing, which I, which is kind of nice. And I, the thing I love about this game, and I liked it. I don't, I don't know, it was in my calling mood. But whatever, I, I got it back, and it's just wonderfully published, you guys. I mean, if you have this game, or if you can get this game, it's fantastic. 
with all this good stuff in it. And the thing that I like about it and the thing that I learned to appreciate over the years is that Jamie and Stonemeyer Games bothered to paint the miniatures, and I love that. All the buildings are painted, and I'm a sucker for that. There's no doubt about it. I do not like gray plastic, black and white games, but in this game, it's absolutely lovely. Uh, the board is pretty. Everything in this game is published wonderfully, and I, when I saw this, and the guy was willing to let it go for $35, I said, yep, yeah, let's get it back. That's for me. That's mine. So, yeah, I was very thrilled to get it back. I haven't gotten it back to the table yet, but I can't wait. And that is Tapestry, folks. If you haven't played it, it's a wonderful civilization builder game where you're just moving up on tracks around the board and getting out your buildings. Yeah, those nice painted miniatures. All right, here's another game we just picked up. Did we get this at Flea Market? Flamecraft, did we get VFM? I forget. How did I get that? Oh, it, it some. We already got to the con and somebody posted, hey, I got this game if anybody wants it. Oh, yeah. That's how we got it. We were at a convention and someone yeah. posted this on the, on the VFM and, and we, we went ahead. And Lori likes this game. I'm going to tell you right now, my wife is in love with this game. And it was a no-brainer for her to get this game. A wonderful box, nice thick box, nice publishing job. Uh, get a, you know, Of course, you have the neoprene mat that comes with it. And of course, if you know my wife, Lori, she's tricked out all the stuff with high class components, because she's a high class girl when it comes to board gaming. And yeah, uh, everything in this game is wonderful. You're just uh, moving her, what is this thing? It came with the... <laughs> That's the fountain. The fountain, okay. <laughs> the fountain that's in the put middle of the table. In there. Oh yeah, put your weed in there, okay. In there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but we didn't like the deluxe version because it was plastic dragons. Uh, these are wooden dragons, and we like the wood a lot better in this game. And you're just moving around to these shops and gathering resources and uh, completing contract cards and so forth. But, you know, my wife's in love with that, and I'm in love with my wife, so I'm playing Flamecraft for the rest of my life. Yeah, it's a great game. Here we go. All right. Now, oh, this is a cool game I got, you guys, called Chronicles of Avell. Oh, my gosh, this game's... <laughs> I saw this game... Uh, somebody talking about it on YouTube before it ever came out. And they didn't have any pictures of anything. Oh my gosh, when I saw it, the game itself on YouTube, I just fell in love with it. And it's called Chronicles of Avel, And it is absolutely wonderful because in it, you're going to be laying out these hex tiles. These are random designs, depending on the difficulty level. So you can ramp up the difficulty if you want. And then you're going to explore. These These here are already turned over, these four. It's your uh, castle tile and then three starter tiles already turned over. The rest of these are face down, and you're going to go through here and explore. And as you explore and turn over those tiles, some of them are market tiles that you're going to be able to use that will give you things. And then other tiles are spawning tiles uh, where monsters are going to be spawned, and you have to battle them. And you get to develop your own character in this game, not real deep, but you do have a character that you're going to be. And look at this. This box is packed full of stuff. Oh, man. And you, the box, you know, you have to build this little stuff. Oh, and look at these. Uh, everything in this game are cardboard miniatures. This, that's the big bad guy. Check him out with his big axe, man. Look at that axe. He's the mean boss guy. And then this is one of the weapons that you can buy, like a crossbow thing and shoots at the monsters. But... Uh, this guy is so cool, and I love all the cardboard miniatures in this game. It keeps the game box small. They're in color, and it's absolutely so much fun. It's an easy game to play. If you have kids, or if you're like me uh, and Lori, we like playing games about fantasy battling and, and uh, defeating monsters and stuff, but we don't want them to be that in-depth that you can't have fun. So we enjoy the lightness of this game. Oops, oops. We enjoy the lightness of Chronicles of Avell, and if you have kids that are or are from 8 to uh, 18, and uh, they like that kind of thing, you might want to check this out, and I'm going to show you some more stuff here. It's co -op and you can help. It is cooperative. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, Lori says, yeah, remind them it's co cooperative. Yeah, it's cooperative game, so you can help them out. And this is some of the other miniatures. Man, I love this stuff. I just love this game. Oh, these things are sweet. They're made out of cardboard, see? And they sit on an angle against the, the tiles, and then this thing spins around, and you put, like, this metal half moon in here. That half moon drops in that hole you've lost. So, I mean, and there's, like, three of these. So these things are really cool. And then 
Oh, this is the, the new big bad boss, this three-headed monster guy. He is tough to beat, man, let me tell you. We barely beat him, didn't we? Yes. I mean, we're experienced board gamers, and we barely beat this guy. And then you got these people, Oberon, is that his name? And, and his wife or something? Oh, yeah. Oberon and Titan. And you can buy, and they got magic items that fit in these slots right here, and you can buy magic items off of them to help, help the players out. Because, man, this game can get rough. You know, that's why I... <laughs> I mean, I watch people or listen to comments. People are like, oh, that game is so easy. Yeah, you didn't buy the expansion, and you didn't play with the big bad beast that come in the second game. But even in the in the uh, base box, that, that boss in that one, depending on how those tiles come out, that will determine how difficult that game is because there's certain things that you need to help you in that game. And if they aren't on some of the closer tiles to the castle and you have to go exploring way deep, you could end up losing the game. But here's some more of these cardboard minis. They're just fantastic. I love them. Those are like three of these toads, and that half moon sits in there, and they move around the board with those half moons on there. And you, there's this cart. <laughs> Is that cute or what, man? I just love this game. And uh, what was the other things? Oh, the spiders. I'm going to show Yeah. Actually, beetles. We just beetles. Them. I call them spiders. Yeah, they're, they're beetles. But you got three of those that are going to be attacking you. Oh, my gosh. This game is the coolest thing. And I love it. I love the way it was designed. It's so much fun. I couldn't believe how much I like this game. Oh, there's those half, metal half moons that are going to be in the game. They're so cool. Oh, just a cool game. It's called The Chronicles of Avel. And I think we got it. Picked it up from Miniature Mart. Something like that. It's disappearing quick, I think. Yeah. Okay, so... Let's move on, man. Let's got, I got. I spent some money this month. Arkham Horror Third Edition. This game I purchased for thirty dollars, still in the shrink, and it was a game that Laura and I played way back in the day, the first edition of Arkham Horror. And I'm going to tell you this right now: we got about three quarters away from that game and said, "You want to stop?" And we never played it again. We just didn't like the clunky clumsiness of it. And then there was a second edition that came out, and now this is the third edition, and supposedly a lot of that is fixed. I have not played this, but I'm hoping. I still got my deck. I'm hoping that that this game is fixed. Uh, it has a modular type of board where you can it'll change shapes uh, according to the scenario or that you're playing or whatever. We've tricked it out with some better dice. The only publishing problem with this game is the dice that come with it are crap. So we've got these beautiful dice that kind of match the color palette in the game and put them in here. But uh, yeah, you got like yeah, yeah, a bunch of token stock and all kinds of cards in this game. I don't know if you've played Arkham Horror 3rd Edition, but just a decks and decks of cards. And yeah, here's a, one of the modular board pieces. And I think there's five of them. And you've got these uh, other uh, pieces that hook them together. What did I do with them? There they are, those things. So they're like hook together like that and then hook another piece on the other side like that so that you can go from location to location. And they change around. So depending on what the scenario is, it's a random setup. So that's pretty cool. But yeah, I, I want to play this game. Here's the thing, guys. I love thematic adventure games. I love them. And um, it's something that I really adore. You know, I love, I love Euro games, but some of these adventure games that I'm going to show you, I really adore too. And this is one of them. I hope it's as good as I think it's going to be. And that's Arkham Horror, the third edition. All right. All right. Hey, bring me look out. All right, this is a freaky game. Dungeon Degenerates. <laughs> Hand of Doom by Goblinko. And I saw this game and the art, I, I immediately said, oh my gosh, that's ugly. That's, that was my instant reaction to it. And the more I watched it, and I watched a guy play it and, and talk about it, and I thought, I think I might be interested in this game. It is a medium weight adventure game, and that's just right up my alley. I love that. And there's the rule book. So that's the mission book. So you got different missions you're gonna go on. And then this is the rule book. And this box, you couldn't get a quarter in this box. It is so packed full of stuff. And all of the art is just like the cover. I mean, it's got that. I don't know. What do you What do you guys think out there in YouTube land? This art is kind of. It looks like blacklight art. Yeah. Oh yeah. Lori said it looks like that uh, '60s and '70s blacklight art that we used to get on our posters when we were teenagers. And I, I agree with her. That's exactly what it looks like. And even your standees, you know, no miniatures in this game. Thank you, Gublinko. We've got full color standees. 
uh, you know, if you were going to do miniatures, paint them, but they, they chose to go this route, and I'm glad they did. We keep in this little container. I have not played this game, but you got decks and decks and decks of cards in here. You're going to go around the board. I'm not going to take the board out, but... It'll... Wait for our nice, nice to show. Yeah, the board looks just like this with different locations, and you're, uh, the locations can get more evil uh, as the game progresses. You have tokens that make them more evil. These things, uh, like the numbers on here, the higher the number, the more evil it's going to get, or the more dangerous, I guess. Not, uh, not evil, but more dangerous. And then you're going to draw cards and do encounters. And I've read some of the cards and in, uh, encounter cards in here, and this is some of the best writing I've ever seen in a board game. I don't really care for games that have huge spiral notebooks of story. The story in Dungeon Degenerates is on the cards, and I love that. Same with Arkham Horror. It's all on the cards, and I really, mm. really enjoy that type of writing. I don't want to spend time in a journal. I just don't want to do that. That's Dungeon Degenerates. All right. All right, here we go. The next game I'm going to talk about is Sanctum. Hey, I picked this game up for 20 bucks, you guys. I think it's only a couple years old, this game. I think it came out in 20, maybe, 2020. But it's from Czech Games, which is one thing I, that attracted me to it. And then I watched it played, and I thought, you know what? I might like this game. But in this game, I'm going to show you in the rule book what you're doing. So you've got, there's only four avatars in the game. I wish they came like that. Oh, but they don't. They come like that. You know, I mean, this is so misleading. Why wouldn't you bother? There's only four avatars in the Dagon game. Paint them just like the Brule book. I, uh, I could just go off on these guys. And uh, in this game, you're going to have these act boards, they're called act boards. And depending on the player count, it tells you which ones to use. And those avatars that you saw, you're just going to place them on here. And each space tells you how many monsters to spawn in these areas here, up and down the act board. And then you're going to take turns selecting those and putting putting them on your uh, monster, this monster, or not, not that, that's the monster track right here that where you put the decks of cards that you're going to seed the board with. And then you're going to gather those monsters and put them on your board here. And you're going to battle them when it's necessary. And then this is your character. You have it, This is your whole character board. And this is your skill table. And there's all these skill cards here. And you're going to move these gems up. And once you move those gems off your skills, you, they become active for you. You're going to go up those act boards. And when you get to the top, you're trying to build yourself up to be as strong as you possibly can. And once you get up to the top, you're going to go up and you're going to battle the big boss man. Yeah, this guy here. And this is what his board looks like. And you're going to get challenged by all this stuff and you're trying to get as absolutely strong as you possibly can because the person who finishes this gauntlet with the most health is going to be the winner and you're all going to have to battle the same thing the same boss the same way and so you want to be as strong and, and as skillful as you possibly can when you get up to that big board and battle that guy so yeah that's what this sanctum is all about a uh, wonderful publishing job i mean this box Wow, isn't it? It's nice and heavy. You get this organizer comes with it, your four avatars and decks of monster cards and you know, all these gem tokens. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I've never played it, but I can't wait to play it because I it's one of those I watched for a long time and I know I'm going to like it. So I can't wait to play Sanctum. Oh, honey, go on. Get, go on. Yeah, I'll believe it. There you go. Okay. Yeah, that is Sanctum, you guys. And it looks like a lot of fun. If you get a chance to pick it up cheap like I did, hey, I would suggest to give it a try. And I, and I will do a video on it, let you know what I really think. All right, then I want to talk about these boxes. Claustrophobia. I think Claustrophobia either came out in 2009 or 2011, I can't remember. But I had this game, and I got rid of it, which is stupid. It's a two-player-only game. And it should have been in my video for two-player-only games. I it was in the bedroom, and I forgot all about it. But uh, it's one of my favorites, and... I had it, I sold it, because they were coming out with a new edition called like Claustrophobia 1647 or something like that. And I said, well, I'm gonna get the new one, I'm gonna get the new one, honey. And then after realizing that the new one had unpainted miniatures in it, I panicked because the old game came with painted minis. And that is a must. If you know me and you watch my channel, that's a must for me. I'm not, I'm not buying games that are brand new with unpainted miniatures in it. Look at this stuff. All brand. This guy, so, I'll tell you in a minute. Anyways, yeah, all these painted minis are just lovely. But I scrambled and, and have never come across a copy that was nice because I didn't want the new one. And I was at a flea market. This guy had the original box 
and it, you can see he didn't even finish punching it. The dashboards have been punched out, and he said he just couldn't get it to the table, and I was like, oh, man. So I offered him $60 for this and the expansion, which is hard to find, and the expansion was also brand new, and it's called De Profundus. This was still in the shrink wrap, and this gives me two female characters. Um, yes, yeah, so I haven't even punched it. I haven't gotten around to it. But it gives me two female characters and the Hellhounds. And then, of course, these are still in the shrink. These uh, beautiful dungeon tiles. You get another deck of cards. Uh, oh, I'm telling you what. I was so happy when I found this. And he sold me both boxes for $60. Bless him. Because I'm really going to enjoy playing this. Look at her. She's just... Every lid that... My cat, she just, she's, she won't get, she's got a box up here on the table, but she gets in my, my game box lids. I don't know why. So yeah, um... And in this game, you have, I think the game book gives you five scenarios, and the winning condition for each scenario is different. You might have to do some side quests and stuff like that to finish and, and win the game, so it depends on what, what scenario you're playing. But this game is absolutely lovely. I love these big, beautiful tiles for the dungeon, and you lay them out as you go. They're so fantastic. And again, if you just, uh, since you've been watching this video, you saw how bland uh, Zombicide tiles were compared to this. I just love this color that just pops on the table. And it does take up some space because these are large tiles. But um, yeah, there's the cards that come with the game. And oh my goodness, man. I was so thrilled to find this game again. And it uses a dashboard thing. You know, this, this will go on a, a piece of plastic, and then you have uh, pegs that you're going to keep track of your stats and uh, you have certain uh, this has a elusive for a special power but and you roll a destiny dice and your destiny dice will go in there this is the destiny board and it depends on what dice you've rolled so like this one says any dice score this one says dice must either be all odd or all even and you put them on there and you get to do that special power two dice with odd scores you put two odd dice on there you get to do that special power one odd die and one even die. So you put one odd and one even on there and you get to do that special power. So that's the way this whole board is laid out and that's such a cool mechanic in this game. It's fantastic. I just, uh, I was so thrilled to get this game. Okay, Katie, how you getting your, 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 getting that one. There you go, sweetheart, there you go. And uh, I was thrilled to get this game back. I can't wait to get it to the table. And that, my friends, is Claustrophobia and Claustrophobia de Provundus. I got both of them for 60 bucks. I'm so happy about that. Okay, next game I want to talk about that I picked up is called Australia by Martin Wallace. Of course, he's the board game designer of Brass, the number one game in the world right now, and has been for quite a while. And it's just absolutely outstanding board game designer. And we have uh, Tinner's Trail and Via Nebula by Martin Wallace. Uh, we love both those games, don't we? Yep. Uh, Via Nebula, super light, nice Euro game that Laura and I just adore playing it. We've had it since it came out. Via Nebula, it's outstanding by Martin Wallace. Now, Martin Wallace also did a game a few years back. This has probably been 15 years ago called uh, Runebound. And... Runebound is very, very popular, and it's an adventure game like this. And we, ha oh, do I have a oh shoot, okay, you know what? I'll talk about that too. <laughs> so I picked up Runebound third edition. I'll tell you about that in a minute. But in Australia, in this game, players are kind of in a semi-cooperative mode because you have a board, and we have we picked up the. Tasmania uh, expansion immediately because it's for two players. It's a smaller board. Uh, the board that comes in the original game is too much sandbox. So this one tightens up the board a little bit. And we so we picked up Tasmania, the two-player board. And you're simply going to seed this board with face-down monster tiles and resources, uh, coal, iron, I believe, and gold. And you're going to lay down rail from your port, each each player will have a port token that will go on this outer part of the board and you're, when, you, when you start the game. And then you have to build rail from the port token to the resources and to the monsters. And you don't want to wake those monsters up until there's a reason to. But you're going to try and pick up as many resources as you can, get as strong as you can, get some uh, military powers, and you're going to want to battle the monsters that are seated on the board because they're going to wake up. The monsters actually become a player in the game on space 20 or 22, something like that. 22. 
And once they wake up, they'll have a token on the time track because everything that you do in this... Oh, shoot, I just hit the camera. Sorry about that, everybody. I'm getting excited telling about the game. Everything you do in this game, you, it costs you time. And so you're moving on this time track, and right there, when you get to space 22, there's a purple disc on there. It starts waking up these monsters. And every time that purple disc goes to an illuminated space, you're going to draw a card, and it's going to tell you who's going to wake up. And then every time you move that purple disc, you have to uh, draw cards off the deck because it's going to move. So every time that purple disc is going to move, something's going to happen. Every space. So uh, it just gets intense after that. And here's some of the main big baddies because you have to, you can't kill them all in one turn. You're going to have to keep track by putting uh, damage cubes to help you keep track of the tile that's on the board. Like this guy's worth 12 points, but it takes 15 damage to kill it. I mean to tell you, if that's near your port, you're sunk. So you better hope that when you laid those monsters out, that guy wasn't near your port because I don't know. And the thing is, you're working together, kind of. The one with the most points at the end of the game is the one that's going to win, and you get points for you know monsters that you defeated and stuff like that. But the thing is, if one person's port is destroyed, everybody loses, all players. So if 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 you're one of your opponents, uh, the monsters are getting close to, and they can't kill that monster if it's getting close to their port, then you got to get over there and help them. You got to find a way to give them a hand and do battle for them to help them out. Otherwise, you're going to lose the game too. So you, it's, it's, that's what I mean by semi cooperative. And that's so cool. They've got some nice gold here in the box. Uh, phosphate, I think this white stuff is, which you don't use in the two player game, but it's kind of nice for all the other player counts. And then uh, there's coal. Yeah, coal. And I think iron, I think that's what that is. I, I can't remember. But nice components, nice cardstock. And one of the things I do want to point out in this game is the large font on these cards. I'm telling you what, that is probably one of the things I notice in like these personality cards that you're going to be able to recruit these people to give you better. Look how big the print is. What is the matter with publishers? That is the way a card should be done right there. Oh, okay. Yep, I'm off my soapbox just for another second here. But that is so nice that they did that. I, when I saw those cards, I was like, oh my gosh, somebody gets it. Yeah, we, uh, I, and I don't think it's just old people that have vision issues. There's other, lots of people wear glasses that aren't old, so. But those cards are so nice and all publishers should do that. And that game is called Australia by Martin Wallace. Again, an adventure. You know, Martin Wallace is known for uh, his Euro game designs. And I like when he stretches his wings a little bit and 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 does something uh, that kind of is a hybrid with uh, Euro game mechanics and a theme that's really fun and interesting, like fi uh, defeating and fighting, fighting and defeating monsters. So that's what you do in Australia, and that's what you do in Runebound. Now I mentioned Martin designed Runebound, first and second edition, and this one, the third edition, was had some tweaks to it, and it was by Lucas Litzinger. And I just love this edition of Runebound. I found this brand new for $30. It's hard to get your hands on a copy of this game, but I would love to get my hands on the expansion for this game because it gives you these combat mats, which Lori made. <laughs> and uh, so we use these combat mats uh, in our game. Those came off board game. Yeah, she got them off board game. You can laminate them. So now we got the combat mats out of the expansion because... Uh, you in in this game, your your combat, you're using these pog tokens, and that's why I love this game. It's different. Uh, it's such a different battle mechanic. You're gonna toss these in the air, you know, and uh, throw them in a dice tray or something, and whichever side they land on, that's what's going to happen. I really really love it. And then in the original rule set, your opponent would be the one to determine how these were played against you, so they could hurt you. But the expansion offered up these combat mats and you lay them out according to their icon on the POG and you just go down and re resolve them one at a time. It speeds the game up enormously. So that was pretty cool. And what else do I love about this game? Well, one thing, and I talked about how ugly the board was in Blood Rage. Check this out, you guys. Yeah, that's what I call a beautiful board right there. This board is absolutely gorgeous in Runebound 3rd Edition. I just love it. It's so immersive, just so beautiful. The artwork, the locations, everything about this game is absolutely beautiful. And I adore it. Uh, all the card stock is linen, beautiful cards, even the mini cards. I don't like mini cards. 
I've never cared for mini cards. I'll never say I do like them. But they're in this game, and I love this game. And that's Runebound, third edition. Again, kind of a semi-cooperative thing where you're adventuring all over that board. You're going to try to get as powerful as you can be, and then uh, the big baddie's going to wake, wake up a certain time in the game, and all players are going to have to go and cooperatively cooperatively try to kill that guy or defeat i don't like to say kill but they're going to try and defeat him and that's runebound third edition by lucas litzinger and a you know tip of the hat to martin wallace because he was the first one that, that did that game hey let's talk about this goofy game <laughs> space agency it's actually called Mleh. But uh, we call it Space Agency because meh just doesn't roll off the tongue real well. And I don't know who would name a game that. I mean, whatever. It's, that just, I don't know what to think about that. But this is by Reiner Kinesia, you guys. It's a dice game. He's done so many great dice games. How could you not be interested? And we watched a couple of reviews of this game. Some were positive, some were negative. But we decided, you know, with... Reiner Kinesia, we're going to take our chances. And we picked the game up, and we absolutely adore this game. It's a 2024. It'll be on my Top Games of 2024 video, you know, a year from now. And it comes with a neoprene mat in the box. And you roll that mat out, and you're going to roll dice and try and get the spaceship to go as high up to the top of this mat as you can go without busting. And it has, uh, gosh, I can't remember what those com the comet-shaped spaces are called. But when you roll one of those, you can reuse that dice. Uh, most of the time, if you if you use these dice, you have to get rid of them. But these, when you see this comet thing, that two value, uh, if you roll a two, you don't have to get rid of that die because it was a comet or something. I can't remember what it's called. This thing is really long. I mean, it's I don't know, it's long. Yeah, well, and you, have to do it. you you would think you can't get the top of that board, but we did it twice in our game. And uh, and then the token stock is super nice. This box is full of stuff. Okay. Yeah, there's expansions in here we haven't tried. Nice big dice. Uh, those are nice. And, well, those are goal end game goals that you kitty cat end game goals, and you get like four of them or six maybe, I don't know, that you're going to try and score. This is the spaceship that everybody's going to use, and uh, somebody's going to be the captain, and everybody else puts one of their kitty cats on here, one of their kitty cat heads. I think you get eight of them, and all of your kitty cat heads have different functions on them. Yeah, so you gotta, you're, you're deciding, what do I want to do? Do I want to try to get off at a moon? Do I want to stay on? Do I want to hope that the, the captain busts? I mean, what, what do I want to do? How do I want to play it? And this is your player board right here. Then you put all your kitty cat heads right here, and they all do different things. And you have to decide which one you want to put on the rocket when it's going up. So there's more to the game than, than just chucking dice, but hey. A little bit like Celestia. Yeah, well, yeah, people compare it to Celestia. You can jump out of the ship. Yeah, you can, time. you can get off the ship and uh, and get off on a moon or a planet whenever you want, depending on what your goal is. But the game is, it's fun, folks. And uh, yeah, I love it. That's, which we call Space Agency. <laughs> Space Agency. I don't know why they wouldn't have just named it Meow. I said that in the beginning. Why not call the game Meow? It's Cats in Space. But... It's so much fun. It's by the most prolific board game designer in the history of board gaming, Reiner Kinesia. So, yeah, worth looking at. All right, here's another game that I was very interested in. It is a cooperative game. It's called the Plum Island Horror. Defend and evacuate the island. And you win by getting, I think, like 26 survivors off the island. Haven't played it yet. Why was I interested in it, you might ask. I'm glad you asked that question, YouTube. Here's the deal. GMT, the publisher of this game, is known for their war games, which if you know and watch this channel, I don't really care for war games. I, it's just something I'm not interested in. But they designed this game, the Plum Island Horror, and I was immediately intrigued by it. So I wanted to give it a go. And I paid full price for this. I tell you how cheap I get stuff. I paid like $71 for this. What's that? Who pointed that game out to you? Oh, my wife Lori saw this and she said, hey, you got to check this out. You might be interested. So I am interested. Cover. Look at the art. I mean, the art in this is so, so 1960s comic book. I just, how can you not adore this if you're uh, 68 years old like I am? Here's some of the groups that you can be in this game. The, the Greenport Township, the Plum Island Constabulary, the Neighborhood Watch. I love that one. I'm going to be the Neighborhood Watch. Mm -hmm. And uh, National Guard. FBI, Security Services, Islanders Athletic Club, the Wolverines. It looks He's carrying an axe, but he must be a football player or something. 
and the Shore Patrol. Those are the, some of the characters you can be. And it's only 10 cents for this comic, yeah. <laughs> now you get in here and this is the rule book. It laid out again like a 10 cent comic back in my growing up days with all your uh, rules and it has a reference book that comes with it. And there's this, you know, it scares me a little bit because there's that rule book's pretty big. And then uh, this is the reference guide. But I've watched it played. It's not that bad. I've watched it played on YouTube and uh, watched it reviewed. So I'm not too put off by the complexity of it. I don't think it's that bad, kind of a medium type of complexity. As you can see, I haven't even punched it yet. But it comes with all these standee characters, all these tokens. And let's get down in here a little bit. Oh my gosh, there's a lot to punch in this game. So boom, those are punch boards are all done. And... The board is really cool. The Plum Island Horror. It tells you the game design, Herman Lutman. Graphics by Terry Leeds and developer is Ken Kuhn. So, hey, and there's some more stuff, cool stuff in the box. And this is just a portion of the board, and it's quite large. Now, when you, they're like different kinds of hordes, zombies and, and various things. But there are stacks of tokens, and they move together on the board and they have to follow these arrows so you know where they're going. <laughs> and that, that probably helps uh, the players quite a bit. And again, you have to rescue 26 survivors off the board in order to win this game in a co cooperative fashion. And some beautiful chunky dice. I love, always love that when they bother to give you dice, it's decent. Two or three decks of cards. And oh, I just can't wait to play the Plum Island Horror. It's intrigued me, it's, it looks interesting. And I can't wait to get it to the table, and I will give you my opinion of that game when the time comes. And do a video on it, because I really, really... Why is all this white cardboard in here? Turn it over. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I should so show you some of this. I might forget what that is. I do know what that is. Oh, yeah, the biohazard track, overrun points track, and then this is your track that's going to... We're saved, 26 plus survivors saved off the island. So yeah, that's that. And then all the uh, player boards here, the characters that you can be. Let's see, what did we say? Yeah, Greenport Township, Islander Athletic Club, Club Horror Mutations. That must be the uh, monster board. Plum Island Constabulary, PIRL Security Services, Neighborhood Watch, and M MPC units. I don't know what all that does. Let's see. And the National Guard. Well, so yeah. That's Plum Island Horror, you guys. I'll let you know what I think of it after I get it played. Uh -huh. And yeah, I think, uh, I think I'm going to have me some board gaming fun. Okay, so now let's take a look at a new game called Keep the Heroes Out. That, uh, now this game I bought brand new and I got it from Game Nerds, which by the way, uh, the game shows up packaged so wonderfully. I mean, they wrap everything in bubble wrap and you're going to get your game in good shape from Game Nerds. I have nothing to do with them, but I do order games from them. So I just wanted to take a minute and say that and give them a shout out. But this game is called Keep the Heroes Out and it is a cooperative adventure game for one to four players. And it's so cute, this game. It's just such a nice little dungeon crawler. And usually games of this nature, dungeon crawlers and uh, fantasy games are so complex and complicated that they uh, tend to have too many rules and be overwhelming for people. And so I wanted to uh, play this game and, and see what I thought about it. But it's, uh, uh, I can see here it's by Brew Games and it's got uh, a rule book that uh, tells you all about how to play the game, you know, game setup and what you do. Uh, it has a list of all the components and then it has... Uh, all the clans listed here because you're going to have all these clans that you you can play and it has a deck of cards for each clan so each clan has a special uh, type of ability tailored just for their clan that's pretty cool and then it gives you a game overview here which is kind of nice and then it does something very nice and tells you what you're doing your turn player's turn i just love that when rule books do it so that you can learn what, what is my turn going to be like what do i do on my turn so a lot of rule books don't even do that it irritates me but it tells you about your actions, uh, your dungeon rooms, and it goes on through various things like that in the rule book. But I, actually, I absolutely love that. And then this is the uh, dungeon book. In this particular game, you can play different scenarios and uh, in a campaign even. So that's pretty cool. Like Chronicle mode here. And the, uh, uh, the difficulty is adjustable. That's always nice uh, in a game like this. 
And then it goes on to all these different scenarios. This one's called the Witch's Cauldron. I think that's the easiest one. And then uh, off with their heads, you know, some cool stuff in here. This is called the Legend of the Rent. All hail to the Bullfrog King. And it tells you how to set up the dungeon and everything. And it tells you in each scenario the special setup and special rules that are going to change in that particular scenario. And that is really neat, you guys. Now, this is called the Bookworm and uh, Midnight Munchies. I like that. Midnight Munchies. But look how cute uh, these tiles are. It's so neat. And, of course, the idea of this game, there's Gentleman Thieves, uh, the Mermaid Lounge. Man, this, this just keeps going. Part-time Wicked Overlord, that one right there. And then uh, the Glee Club Reunion. <laughs> that is so cute. And a Dragon's Treasure, Bad Press. Just look at all these scenarios you can play in this game. Endangered Species, Sold Out Tickets. And it goes up to, let's see, 18, how many is in here? 20 scenarios, new beginnings. So you have a lot in this box, a lot of game. And then on the back of the rule book, it tells you about the hero's invasion and what they're going to do when they invade the dungeon because that's what this game is about. The monsters aren't the bad guys, they're the good guys. They're trying, <laughs> they're trying to protect their treasure and keep the heroes from looting all the treasures that they've kept and uh, over the years and and the heroes are trying to get in and get that stuff and we're trying to cooperatively keep them out and that's why it's called keep the heroes out and look how cute the art is on these tiles you guys i mean this is just a game that screams cuteness and i love that it's a dungeon crawler because those can be intimidating for people that have never played one before and you just lay these tiles out and each tile has a special function and oh it's really really a cool game. I hope I haven't played it. I just have watched it played. And I know Lori and I are going to love it. It's got adorable meeples. It does. And it's got, uh, those are all the dungeon tiles. And it's got all these tokens that you're going to populate the dungeon with. And, uh, you know, other tokens, your health tokens and so forth like that. Uh, in those. And it's got uh, over 200 cards in here. Uh, these are the clan. This is the clan cards I told you about. This whole deck of cards. And you can see what clan it goes to by the icon in the upper right hand corner. But look how cute the art is in this stuff. <laughs> that looks pretty sweet. But yeah, yeah. Just, ah, just adorable stuff. And this game is going to be fun. I can tell you right now, I'm going to have a good time and I will tell you guys what I think of this game when I uh, uh, do my review of it. It's from 2022, so it's relatively new, and I just didn't get a chance to play it during 2022 or 2023, so it'll be new to us, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think this is called the Guild Deck or something like that, Dungeon Deck maybe, but uh, yeah, I get a lot of cards with the game. Such cute art on all this stuff. It just makes you want to play it immediately. Look at those swords. It's really, really sweet looking stuff. Okay. So then we got all these gorgeous wooden meeples. They're so adorable. And you get there. Like I say, there's nine different clans you can play. And that is so neat. Look at them. They're so cute. Look at a skeleton guy and the ghost and the dragon. Oh, so neat. You know, it's much better than the gray plastic unpainted miniatures, something like this. It adds to the game instead of taking away from it. I love that. Then these are, I think these are like, oh yeah, you put your dungeon deck on there. And and this is your difficulty level. So that's what, uh, ooh, I don't know, they're two-sided. So I, wow, yeah. So you put your dungeon deck on there for each scenario or whatever, and depending on your difficulty level. So that's pretty neat too. Hey, that is going to be so much fun to play. That's it for today. That's all I wanted to show you guys is games that we picked up. This is the most we've added to our library in ages. Yeah. And now we have a lot of games we haven't played, which is rare for us. We just don't have a shelf of shame per se. So we've got a lot of games to get played so that we don't get into that habit because we don't like that. And Keep the Heroes Out is one that I'm looking forward to playing. I hope you found this video fun. But it was fun for me to show you guys our games. And, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll see you next time. Hey, everybody. So that's it for today's video. I hope you had fun uh, looking at that video. And I was 
having fun presenting those games to you and showing you what's in the box and so forth. And I'm interested in playing those games. That's why I picked them up. And I know that some of you have probably played some of them. And maybe you can let me know in the comments what you thought of those games when you played them. So I'm glad that I was able to show them to you. I'll let you know how I feel about them as I play them. And I want you to keep on board gaming because it's the best hobby on the planet because of those games I showed you today. And I'll see you the next time on The Bones Collector. I love every one of you. Bye-bye.